All right, if you'll take the word of God, I want you to turn me to the Old Testament, to the book of Proverbs, chapter 11. We'll find a familiar passage of scripture here to us, Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 30. And if you want to also find John chapter 1, you can put your finger there, Proverbs chapter 11 and verse 30. The Bible says, the fruit of the righteous is a tree of life, and he that wins souls is wise. And we've been taking that phrase, he that wins souls is wise, and, and we will continue to do so and, um, tonight and move into some more things here about the assurance of salvation and helping someone else with that. Um, and so let's pray. Father, we sure do thank you for your word tonight. We thank you for salvation. Uh, through your son, Jesus Christ, and his death, his burial, his resurrection. Thank you for that. Thank you for your Holy Spirit you give us. And um, everything that you give us through the Holy Spirit in our life, all the leading, the guiding, the power, the discernment. And uh, Father, we're so thankful for that, that you just didn't leave us alone. And you even promised us you'll never leave us nor forsake us. And so we thank you for these promises. We thank you for the things that you've done for us. And uh, Lord, tonight, um, may we be encouraged that we can be assured that we have eternal life and that life is through your Son. Father, help us to live in that every day and be very thankful and grateful that we know that and that your Holy Spirit bears witness with us that we're we're your children. And would you you guide us tonight and uh, help us to be determined to help other people who don't know this, and we ask this in Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So we started talking about um, how we have a conversation with someone, and we find out uh, a little bit about their church background, and we give our testimony, and how we come to know the Lord as our personal Savior, and then we find um, out if they're sure that they have, if they have eternal life or not, if they know 100% sure they're on the way to heaven, and uh, at this time, we'll take the Word of God and share with them that Jesus came and what he did for them so that they could have eternal life. And we don't want to stop there. We want to bring them at this point to a place of making a decision either to reject or receive Jesus Christ as their personal Savior uh, there. And we talked about how, you know, somebody would receive the Lord as their Savior. So we're moving beyond that now. They have prayed to receive Christ as their Savior. And, um, and then I said how we would try to explain to them a little bit more about eternal life um, helping them to understand from the Word of God uh, that, they, that they have um, this assurance and they ha- can have eternal life. And I talked about giving them two different kind of tracks that we use. And if you need some of those, obviously we have some of those um, there, the baptismal track, and, and I, I just trusted Christ. Now what? What do I do now? Um, and so those are helpful tracks just to get somebody going. But when we, uh, when we talked last time, we were talking about questions for a new believer. And um, what we always want to do is point anybody back um, to the Word of God because that's where our faith is is based in the Word of God. If we're going to be certain about anything, it's got to be certain from the Word of God. And uh, so we asked some questions. We took, we took, we went back to some scriptures and we looked at some some words or phrases. Um, last time we went to Romans ten thirteen and we looked at the word saved. We went to John three sixteen and thirty six and looked at the phrase everlasting life. We went to John 3, 18 and looked at how that uh, if someone's believed on Christ, there's no condemnation. And then we looked at John 5, 24, and it says you, that the person who's believed on Christ has passed from death unto life. This is talking about spiritual life. And uh, 1 John 5, 11 through 15, we looked at absolute assurance that we can know that we have eternal life. And these are some scriptures that you can use to help somebody um, and show them what has happened, the person who doesn't believe and the person who does believe, and how there's that difference, and there's a time in your life when that difference happens when you trust Jesus Christ as your Savior. And so we ask those questions, and you're always referring them back to the Word of God because you want to base somebody in the Word of God because if you ever die and you're ever gone or they ever move and you're not around, they need to know they, they, what they got from the Word of God. And, uh, of course, the Holy Spirit's helping them um, as a new believer. Um, But we also want to talk to them about what happens to a person when they receive Jesus Christ as their personal Savior. And so I want to give you three things tonight that happens. The first thing is, is the Lord saves whoever believes on Him. He's the one that does it. So He saves. And uh, and we're going to, we say this is positional. 
and his, his saving power. Uh, look at John chapter 1, where I told you you could go ahead and put your finger there. In John chapter 1, beginning in verse 12 and then in verse 13, it says, But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born... Now, these are the ones that become the sons of God who believed and received Jesus as their Savior. It says, which were born, that would be re referring to being born again, not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. So we said that the Lord saves whoever believes on Him. Now, you could obviously, when you're talking to somebody about this, you could say, now, did you believe on Him, the Lord Jesus Christ, as your Savior? And they were probably going to say yes. And say, well, this is talking about you. He saved you. And the Bible says that our salvation, his saving us, is not of blood, is what verse 13 says. It's not of blood, which were born not of blood. And this means that salvation is not because of who we were born to or where we were born. That has nothing to do with our salvation. No one can lay a claim on being born and being made to be a son of God on anything but receiving and believing on Jesus Christ. There's people that try to do that. Um, the Jews, Jewish people try to do that all throughout the time when Jesus was here on earth. They were, they were very big on this, that they were descendants of Abraham. We have Abraham as our father. <laughs> Jesus didn't seem to be too... Uh, too thrilled with that uh, when they would say that and point back to that. Or we have Moses and the law, and, uh, but specifically Abraham. And, and it's not of blood just because you were born. Um, just, just because you have this certain lineage does not make you saved. It might help you to get saved. And I mean this, that if you have a godly heritage and they taught you the word of God as you were growing up, that will never hurt, right? Um, but it, it will not save you. And then our salvation is not of blood, but it's not also of the will of the flesh, the Bible says in verse 13. And this means that salvation is not because of the amount of good works that we can perform in our own strength and in, in with our life or our personal desires. It's, it's none of our will. It's nothing that the flesh conjures up. Um, that we can do. It's not of us. Romans 6, 23 says, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Um, it's not the will of our flesh. Uh, 1 Corinthians 1, 18. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness. Well, people that are lost, they're perishing. It's foolishness. It's not the will of their flesh to get saved. But unto us, which are saved, it is the power of God. And so it's not the will of man. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 8 and 9. For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. So it's in faith. It's not the will of man that he's working his way or performing anything uh, with his own life to get him there, to heaven, or to obtain salvation. Titus chapter 3. Titus chapter 3 and verse 5 and following. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. So that takes away all the works that we can do to get saved. It was by his mercy that he saved us, by the washing of regeneration and renewing, of the Holy Ghost, which He shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ, our Savior, that being justified by His grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. And so that's not of us. God's mercy and God's grace and the regeneration work of the Holy Spirit, all of that came through Jesus Christ, the Bible tells us here, and not of our own selves. So it's not of blood, not of the will of the flesh. And the Bible says that it's not of the will of man. 
Our salvation is not of the will of man. This means salvation is not because of what any man can do for us or do to us. It means no, no baptism that somebody can do to us is going to save us. Nobody can do anything for you. So we can put that to rest. It's not the will of man. As much as I want people to be saved, I cannot save any person. I wish I could. I really wish I could. But then it wouldn't be their own will. And they really wouldn't get saved. But I have people that I love that I wish would be saved. And you do too. But it doesn't work that way. Now we can pray for them, and we ought to, and prayer is powerful, but they have to make this decision for themselves. So it's not the will of man. So someone can't tell you that you're saved. And you be saved. You have to receive Christ for yourself as, your, as Savior. But the Bible does say in verse 13, if I can get back there to John 1, verse 13, it says, but of God. They're born of God. If you're going to be the son of God by receiving and believing on Jesus Christ as your Savior, that means you've been born of God. Not of the other things, not of blood, not of the will of the flesh, not of the will of man, but of God. If a person is going to be born into the family of God, it is because the Lord did it. It's because the Lord saved them. And so according to the word of God, the Lord is the one who saves a person that believes on him. Nothing else. Nothing else. If we can go back to the word of God, then a person can say, I was saved by what Jesus Christ did for me. What the Lord did for me, he saved me. Now, not only does he save us, anybody who will believe on him, but the Lord keeps whoever believes on him saved. So every person that comes to him that he saves, he also keeps that person saved. I want you to go to John chapter 10 with me. Again, this is a, a positional statement. When I say positional, that means who we are in Christ. Uh, a lot of people get really messed up on this uh, salvation um, and the difference between what we're going to talk about next about practical salvation um, and positional salvation, and they mess everything up. And uh, they don't see that being in Christ changes everything about us. But we can still do some practical things that we shouldn't be doing. So positionally, praise God, we're not who we were. And we never will be that person again, by the way, positionally. Our sins are all taken care of, positionally in Christ. So the Lord keeps whoever believes on him saved. John chapter 10, if I didn't tell you where the scripture was, verse 27. John chapter 10, verse 27. Jesus was speaking here, and he gives us long description here. We don't have time to go through all of John chapter 10 about the shepherd and his sheep, and he's the shepherd, and he's the good shepherd, and he's the door. And uh, he gets down to verse 27, and he says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. That's nice, isn't it? My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. I'm glad I'm one of his sheep. But he did it. He saved us. And you know what he does for his sheep? He keeps them. He keeps his sheep. And the Bible says in verse 30, 28, And I give unto them, whoa, what is it that he gives them? Eternal life. And they shall one day perish. No, never. These are some pretty definite words he gives here. I, I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. All right, so Jesus is talking about himself here. No one's going to pluck them out of my hand. No one's going to take any of my sheep because I'm going to, I'd lay my life down for the sheep. Actually, I've already, I'm going to lay my life down for the sheep. At this time, he was speaking forward. I'm going to lay my life down, and I'm going to take my life back up. But, I, but as a shepherd, no one's going to take us out of his hands. And the Bible says, My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all. And no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. And so according to the word of God, when a person believes on the Lord, they receive eternal life and they're placed in the hand of Jesus. 
What a beautiful picture we have there. Obviously, there's no shepherd that ever held his sheep in the palm of his hand and, and, and closed them. But you get the picture uh, here of how he is holding us. We're in his hand. And then the Bible says here, a person is also placed in God the Father's hand. So the believer is what we might call double protected. Imagine you take something and um, you put it in an envelope and you seal that envelope. Let's just say that's Jesus Christ. Then you have a bigger envelope and uh, you take that little envelope and place it inside the bigger envelope and you seal that one up. Well, nobody, let's just make pretend, nobody can get into the large envelope because it's greater than anything that anybody could ever use to try to get that open. So how are you ever going to get to the small envelope to try to open that one? You're not. You're not. And we're in Christ's hand, which is enough. But the Bible says we're also in God's, the Father's hand. And nobody's greater than him. Nobody's going to pluck us out of his hand um, because he's got us and he's holding on to us. And so we don't keep ourselves in the hand of Jesus. And we don't keep ourselves in the hand of God the Father. They're holding on to us. See, this is the way some people picture it. Well, I'm holding on. I'm holding on to the end. Wait a minute. He's holding on to you. You can't hold on to yourself. Well, well, the Bible doesn't say, yeah, no man can pluck you out of his hands, but the Bible didn't say that you couldn't do it. Come on. Now, that's just bad Bible teaching. <laughs> Yes, the Bible didn't say you couldn't do it, but you are one of those no men. And he's the one that saved you, and he keeps his sheep, and he holds you, and positionally you are in his hand, and you, you do not keep yourselves in the hand of Jesus and God the Father. The church does not keep you in the hands of Jesus or God the Father. It's the Lord that keeps you in his hand. Look at uh, 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 5. First Peter chapter 1, verse 5. Uh, let's back up to verse 3. This is such a beautiful passage of Scripture. And it says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to His abundant mercy hath begotten us again. That sounds a lot like John chapter 1, being born of God the Father and being made to be the Son of God unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance, incorruptible and undefiled, and that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. Now, it goes on after that comma, and it says, for you who are kept... By your own power. I hope you're reading along with me. Who are kept by the power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. He's the one that keeps us. He has saved us. He is saving us and he will save us. You know that? He saved us spiritually. He made our spirit alive whenever we trusted Him as our Savior. When we received and believed Him in John chapter 1 and positionally, He made us to become a son of God because we were born of Him. He, we got, he grabbed us in His hand and the Father grabbed us in His hand. And positionally, we're in Christ. Spiritually, we're saved. Our soul is being saved right now from the actual power of sin. We're yielding to God and we're, we're becoming more liberty and more free in the Holy Spirit in our soul to make the decisions that Christ wants us to make and becoming free from the bonds of this world. And one day our body is going to be saved. It's going to be changed from no more sin. It'll be wonderful. And this is talking about that fool the faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. 
There is a salvation that will solidify with body, spirit, soul, and body. If you're ever saved spiritually, the soul and the body are coming along. <laughs> um, you're you're going you're gonna to be complete one day in Christ's presence. He's keeping us. We're kept by the power of God. I do remind you in John chapter 10 that no one is greater than him. And then I want you to know this. The Lord cleans whoever believes on him daily. Now this is the practicality of the believer's life. Positionally, we've been saved. We are being saved and one day our body will finally be saved. But we're living in it right now and I don't want you to remember that. That we're still living in this body. Because this is what we're dealing with when we deal with the practical. And he's keeping us saved under his power and by his power. Now, go to 1 John 1.9. 1 there are multiple passages of Scripture that talk about the cleansing of the Word of God and other things in our life uh, and, and how the Lord uses these things. But we're going to hear 1 John uh, chapter 1 and verse 9. Written to believers uh, here, this book, um, to know that we have eternal life. Um, and we see in verse 9, it says, If we confess our sins, He, talking about the Lord, is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And so the question that you probably need to pose, and we pose to ourselves tonight, but to a new believer, is, is it possible for a believer to sin? Now, that, that just seems automatic that we understand yes, because you're reading the Bible and you're seeing the Bible, what it says... But for a new believer, who knows what they've been taught? And there are groups of believers that teach, once you get saved, you don't sin anymore. Now, positionally, I don't. Christ never sinned, and I'm in Christ, and I have his righteousness, and I will never have sin on my record again. Okay, positionally, it's done. It's done. I'm already in heavenly places seated with Christ. I'm already there. And you are too, if you know the Lord. But for, for the believer, can we still sin? Yes. I want to go with you to Romans chapter 7. Romans chapter 7. Now, how many of you would say that the apostle Paul is a believer? Okay. Well, not everybody's raising their hand, but I, I, know, I do know you believe that uh, Paul's a believer here when he's being used to write to the Roman believers. And uh, when he gets here to chapter 7, um, he gives us some insight to some things. And... Uh, and we start in verse 15 of Romans chapter 7. For that which I do, I allow not. For what I would, that do I not. But what I hate, that do I. Sounds like he wants to do righteousness, but he's doing unrighteousness. If then I do that which I would not, I consent unto the law that it is good. Now, then it is no more I that doeth it, but what? Sin that dwelleth in me. For I know that in me, that same phrase in me, he's about to explain what this sin that dwelleth in him is, that is my flesh. Okay? So when Paul got saved, he's a saved man here. He's being kept by God's power. But guess what Paul still has? His flesh. He walk, he's walking around in it. Uh, by this point, he's been beaten, and it's been hurt pretty bad, but he's still got flesh, and he's still alive. And he said, in his flesh that he has as a saved man, is still sin there. The practicality, the battle that's raging that we find here. He said, in, my, in me that is in my flesh dwelleth no good thing, for to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good I find not. For the good that I would I do not, but the evil which I would not, that I do. Now, if I do that I would not, it is no more I that do it, but sin that dwelleth in me. Back to his flesh again. I find then a law that when I would do good, Evil is present with me. 
Can a believer sin? Yes, because we're still in this flesh. The flesh has not been saved yet. The flesh has not been glorified yet. And we still have this flesh. And there's no good thing about our flesh. And evil's dwelling with us. But praise the Lord that we have a new man. Praise the Lord that we have the Holy Spirit of God living in us as well. Look at 1 John chapter 2. When we're thinking about this question, is it possible for a believer to sin? Now, again, you never want to give anybody the idea that God is okay with sin. See, he didn't give us the flesh to begin with. He didn't give us the sin nature. Adam and Eve disobeyed God. And that's what come upon them. The death and the sin. And so now we have it. And death's passed upon all men for that all have sinned. So God didn't do it before somebody starts thinking that God did this. And now if you are a hyper-Calvinist, you do believe God gave us this sin nature. And you do believe God's causing us to sin. But that's a whole other rabbit hole to go down and trail. Okay? 1 John chapter 2. Look what the Bible says. My little children... These things write I unto you, that ye sin not. Now, why would he have told them that they shouldn't sin if they were impossible for them to sin? That wouldn't make any sense. And if any man sin, oh. And then he said, if you do sin, I don't, God doesn't want you to sin. But if you do sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. And he... Jesus Christ the righteous, is the propitiation for our sins. And not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. And so the answer is, is it possible for a believer to sin? Yes. So what happens when a believer sins? There's a multitude of ways you can talk about it. You can talk about that, this, that the believer grieves the Holy Spirit, uh, that they're, when they're sinning, they're walking in the flesh, and they're going to produce the works of the flesh. Um, but I want to just look at it from this position tonight, that every believer has a relationship with the Lord as a child. And this is where we need to separate the two. We have a relationship with the Lord, and then we have fellowship with the Lord. A relationship is like the positional part. It never changes. Once we're a child of God, once we're become, he's made us to be a son of God, once we're born again into his family, that doesn't change. He's our father and we're his child because of what he's done. Now, this fellowship, it's that practical part. It's that part that talks about how close we are within our relationship that we have. And so in 1 John Chapter 1, we go back there, and verse 5, the Bible says this, This then is the message which we have heard of him, talking about the Lord, and declare unto you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. So that means if we say we're walking with him, but we're walking in darkness... That's not true. That's not right. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship, look what the Bible says, one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. So when we sin, it breaks this fellowship that we have with God the Father and other believers. Other believers that are walking with him. That's why it's so important for us to be walking with the Lord individually so we can walk with the Lord collectively. That was the beautiful thing about the early church in the book of Acts was that they were all in one accord. Isn't that amazing? All these people didn't know anything. They didn't know what a New Testament church was. They they had no idea about anything of that. No New Testament scriptures, but they trusted Christ and the Holy Spirit come to live inside of them, and they were all in one accord. They were all being led of the Holy Spirit and walking with God. What a beautiful thing that we ought to let the Lord do in us as well. But this fellowship, sin breaks this fellowship. And if we break our fellowship with the Lord, then we forfeit the benefits of our relationship with the Lord. If our fellowship gets broke then everything and all the blessings that we have from our relationship with the Lord, it all gets muddied up. 
Look at 2 Corinthians chapter 6. 2 Corinthians chapter 6, beginning in verse 17. Of course, you'll know this chapter by him asking um, about, or talking about be not unequally yoked, and he talks about several things here. Then he gets to verse 17, and he says, Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. So what is he telling them? He's telling them to have fellowship with me. And if you're going to have fellowship with me, you cannot have fellowship with the flesh and the world. It's one or the other. But if you'll separate from the flesh and the world and touch not the unclean things of the world, he said, I'll receive you. I'll receive you. He didn't, he didn't say he was not their father. He did not say that he did not know them. But he said, I can't receive you because your sin is breaking our fellowship. But if you will do way with that and come to me, I'm going to receive you. Reminds me of uh, James chapter 4 when he says, draw nigh unto God and he'll draw nigh unto you. He's just waiting to draw close to you when you will do what you ought to do and cleanse your hands, you sinners, <laughs> and then come to him. He'll help you. But look what the Bible says here. He says, and will be a father unto you. He didn't say, now once you separate yourself and you, you turn from the unclean things and you get away from all the unclean things, then I'll be your father. He said, I'll be a father unto you. He said, as long as you're willing to have fellowship with the world and walk in the flesh, I cannot be a father unto you. You cannot have all the blessings that I want to bestow upon you as a father within our, my relationship with you because you're not allowing me to do that. He didn't say I was going to become your father. He already is. But he says, there's some things I want for you that you don't want for yourself, and I can't give them to you until you come to me and you separate. So he wants to carry out the role of a father to us, but we have to walk with him. And by the way, our relationship with the Lord is completely dependent on him. But our fellowship is completely dependent on us. The Bible gives us a choice. Uh, go with me to Romans chapter 6. And when I say it's completely dependent on us, we obviously, when we yield to Christ, He gives us power over the sin to do what we ought to do. But if we're not willing to let the Lord work through us, then there, the, fellowship, the fellowship's not going to be very good. In Romans chapter 6, look at verse 12. And, and while we're reading, I want you to pay attention to these words. Let and yield. Okay, those are things that you make a choice about. You can either let something happen or not let it happen. You can yield to one thing or you can yield to another thing, but you're always doing these things. And these are decisions and choices that we make. And the Bible says here, Let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. And there's other places in the Bible that talks about let, um, let not or let or do these things or yield to Christ or you know, mortify uh, the deeds of the flesh and all these things. But those are choices that we make. And that fellowship that we have depends on what are we going to make the choice to do. Are we going to make the choice to walk with God? and allow Him to give us what He wants, and His power, and His strength, and everything, and the fruit of the Spirit that we need to have in our life to glorify Him? If not, then our relationship's not going to be very good. Well, our fellowship within our relationship. And we're going to feel like our relationship's not good because we're not going to be close to the Lord like we ought to be. And He's not able to Sucker us, like the Bible says, as a father because he can't be a father in us because we're like the prodigal son that has went off into a far land and he's just waiting for us to come back so he can be a father to us. 
What can we do about our broken fellowship with the Lord? Well, in 1 John, uh, verse 1, or chapter 1, sorry, uh, chapter 1, uh, verse 9, the Bible says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So the Bible talks about confessing our sins here, and that just means to agree with the Lord about our sins. Now, I'm not confessing here or agreeing with God about my sins like I did when I got saved. Like, He took those away from me, and He forgave me. And by the way, I didn't agree with God about all my sins. I didn't write them down, or I didn't tell God, okay, now you know I did this sin when I was two and three and four, and I went through a list. Uh, sometimes when people say, you've got you to gotta ask the Lord to forgive you of all your sins, or you've got to confess all your... You can't confess all your sins, okay? But you can confess that you're a sinner and that you're separated from God, and you know there's no hope without Him. And, uh, and that mindset of confession, agreeing with God, is... Uh, is a mindset of faith. And so as the Holy Spirit convicts us in our sin and we realize that we have to come back to the Lord, we need to talk to the Lord about it. And we need to ask Him really to agree with Him to ask Him to help us with this in our life and sin in our life uh, or the temptations that could so easily beset us as we're running our race. And so we need to tell the Lord that we're guilty of what he's told us not to do, or we're guilty of not doing what he's told us to do in our life. And it's really not for God. It's for us. He never, he never wants any confession, and it's not for him. It's for you. Have you ever found that confession, agreeing with God, talking to him about yourself, um, is good? It's good to agree with God? Um, whether it's something bad or something good, if you agree with them and talking to them about it. In Proverbs chapter 28, the Bible says this in verse 13. He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. And I think true confession, agreeing with God, also brings some uh, forsaking with it. That repentance, that change your mind about something, agreeing with God about it. And it's then and only then will the Lord restore our fellowship and benefits of our relationship with Him. And He's the one that's faithful and just. The faithful and just part doesn't rest on us. We just have to come to Him to walk in the light. So we can have fellowship with Him and we can have fellowship with others as well. The Bible says in, in John chapter 8 and verse 32... Jesus was speaking, and he said, And ye shall know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. The truth will help us to stay in right fellowship with the Lord. Obeying the truth will help us to stay in right fellowship with the Lord. And look at 1 John chapter 3. First John chapter 3 and verse... 22. And whatsoever we ask, we receive of him because we keep his commandments. That would be describing fellowship with him, walking with him by faith, and do those things which are pleasing in his sight. If we stay in right fellowship with the Lord, then he promised to give us what we ask for. He promises us to be able to come to him and seek him because we're walking with him by faith the way he has asked us to in our life. And, you know, throughout, throughout our life, yes, we're saved positionally, and yes, he keeps us saved positionally, but practically, when we don't walk like we're saved because we're in the flesh, then he can clean us up, and he can help us. And I <laughs> praise the Lord for that that he just don't leave us out on the limb somewhere, um, but we can come back to him. And that should not be the normal thing for the believer in fellowship with God. But it does happen with this evil flesh that we live in. But throughout our life, we're going to need to ask the Lord to do some things for us. And that means we're going to need to let him clean us up. We're going to need to let him clean us up <coughs> if we want to receive the things that we ask for. 
And, uh, and those two things go together. But he can clean us up on a daily, a daily time. And we need to be coming clean with him. And, and, and look, we can sin and we have this flesh. And if we give way to it, you better head to the Lord as quick as possible. And you better pray and you better talk to him about it. And not only talk to him about it, like some people come to the altar and say, I've got this problem, Lord. And then they get up and they leave and they still got the problem because they went back to their seat with it. Well, that's not confession. That's not repentance. That's not believing God for that thing. It's, well, now I feel better because I told God about it. He put his finger on it one more time. And uh, you're right, Lord. But you have no intention (laughs) of stopping that thing or doing anything about that thing in your life. But that's not what we're talking about. That's not getting clean. That's not getting clean. His purification, His presence, um, He will clean you up. I remember when He was talking to one of His disciples and, and He was talking about washing their feet. And He said, no, 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 don't wash my feet. He said, oh, really? He said, you're not clean with all. He said, unless you let me wash your feet. And the disciple said, well, the Lord, then wash my hands and wash my head as well. <laughs> what are you saying? Just wash me all over. Get me clean. And, um, and, you know, that's how we ought to feel. Lord, uh, we're not worthy for you to wash our feet, Lord. This is, this is horrible that you have to wash our feet. But as we walk out, just like in their culture at that time, as we walk in this world, we get dirty. We see things, we hear things, we get dirty. Lord, clean us up. Clean my mind up so I can think right and be right because this is how you want me to be. So it's not right that our Lord has to clean us up like that. But I'm so glad he's willing to. And we should say, Lord, just clean us all up. Just in and out thoroughly, just clean us up and keep us clean for thee. And uh, we should come to the Lord that way. And we should be confident in our salvation. And we should help others be confident in their salvation. Father, help us. Uh, we, can't, we can't do it. Any confidence that we have is going to come from your word and, and the fact that of your leading and guiding in our life and you helping us. And if anybody else is going to get help, it's because you're going to be working in their hearts and lives too. But we sure want to be used of you that way, but we have to be in fellowship with you and we have to be clean ourselves. Lord, I'm glad you're merciful to us and I'm glad you're gracious and I'm glad you keep us by your power. But help us to never just say, because positionally I'm right, The practicality doesn't matter. Father, we understand that that's not true. That you're concerned about our whole spirit, soul, and body. And may we help other people who may be struggling with this, and especially new believers, to understand what they have in you. So, Father, we we love you and we thank you for this. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Heads bowed, eyes closed, altars are open. Maybe you're here tonight and you say, Brother Justin, I'm lost. I'm lost. If I died right now, I'm not 100% sure if I go to heaven. Then you need to refuse to place your faith in yourself and anything that you can do to get to heaven. It's only in Jesus Christ and his death, burial, and resurrection in that he died, was buried, and raised from there to pay for your sins completely. If you'll confess that you're a sinner and receive Jesus Christ as your Savior, I promise you he'll save you. Because the Bible promises he'll save you. I can go back to the word of God on it and he'll make a promise to you. Many promises. You can be saved tonight. Believers, do you have a desire to tell others how to be saved? I trust you do. I trust we'll take those opportunities. We'll be available. Do you have a desire to help others know that they are saved? Not only to be saved, but then to understand what the scripture says about what has happened in their life, what the Lord has done and what he's going to be doing. This is a good way to tell if we're following the Lord or not or how our fellowship is with the Lord. It's a very good litmus test. And we need to pray that the Lord will give us a desire to follow him and to win souls and to be clean. And that's what he wants for us. I can tell you God's will for your life tonight is to be clean. So walk in fellowship with him. 
and it's to tell other people about Jesus and help them to be clean and walk in fellowship with him. It's God's will for all of our lives tonight. We need to yield to that and let the Lord help us. Father, we're so thankful that you, that you care so much about us and that you just didn't save us and you just let us sit there and you didn't do anything. You, you made us one of your children, but you, you're not going to help and mature us and guide us. No, no, no. You are guiding us. You, your great desire is not only to see us saved, but to, to follow you and to lead us by your Holy Spirit, uh, empower us to do the things that we could never possibly do in and of ourselves. And, it, and it's always an amazing an unbelievable thing that you would use us as sinful men in this sinful flesh. Um, that's, there's no good thing in it. The uh, only good thing in our flesh is you're living inside of this flesh um, in our spirit. And uh, we're so thankful for that. Thankful for the new desires you give us and the new mind that you give us. And uh, we sure do want to make the right decisions based on that and based on your word. So would you guide us and direct us in that? And would we yield to it tonight? Father, we need... We need great assurance in our life as we walk with you for the right direction to go and do. And, and we want to be available for you to put us in people's lives to help them as well. And so we ask this, Lord, um, in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. All right, until we meet again, take time to know the Lord and to make him known. May the grace and peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. God bless.